Shall we go ahead? What do I, you think? I think it's fine. We, we've got, uh, what, 50 plus people okay. waiting, waiting patiently. Well, hopefully Bertram will join us shortly. I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to this Tuesdays with the Museum event. I'm Tara Barish, Curatorial and Collections Manager for the Museum. Tonight we'll be having a conversation with local archaeologist Don Montoya and Hopi guide Bertram Sabatawa about the significance of rock imagery from archaeological and cultural perspectives. This conversation is part of a project supported by the Utah Humanities Council, which brought together the museum, Don and Bertram, to create a video interpreting four prominent Moab petroglyph sites. This video, which we will link in the comments, presents interpretations on the Birthing Rock, Moonflower Canyon, Wall Street, and Poison Spider. A temporary exhibit currently at the museum also showcases key excerpts from this video. We hope tonight's conversation will provide a helpful supplement to the video project, and we encourage everyone tuning in to come to see the related ex exhibit that we have on display now. It's only up through October 17th, so if you are intrigued by the subject matter, don't wait too long. I would like to begin by also reading our land acknowledgement statement, which was adopted by the museum in 2020. We acknowledge the land we currently identify as the Moab Valley to be the traditional and ancestral lands of Ute and clans of ancestral Pueblo people. We pay our respects to all their elders, past and present, and choose to honor and acknowledge the original stewards of this land in hopes of building mutual respect and understanding across all cultures, those that reside here and those that pass through here today and in the future. As we discuss the region more broadly, including sites which are significant to numerous cultural groups, we must acknowledge the Paiute, Hopi, Zuni, and Diné who also share deep ties to this region. It looks like Bertram is here. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah. as, he's, as he's getting um, situated, I would like to go ahead and briefly introduce Willie. The video we're about to show introduces Ton and Bertram, but not Willie. So I'll tell you just a couple things. Willie Paloma manages Utah Center for the Book as part of the Utah Humanities Council and coordinated this project, bringing Don Bertram and the museum together in conversation about interpreting and protecting rock imagery sites along the Colorado River near Moab. Thank you, Willie, and thank you to the Utah Humanities Council. Thank you, Tara. I am Mary. I also work at the Moab Museum on Community Outreach and Programs. I am here to offer technical support tonight. So just a couple uh, brief comments before we uh, begin screening the video that will begin our conversation. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A here on Zoom. This is also being broadcast on Facebook Live, so guests who are tuning in there, please add your questions to the comments under Facebook. And I will relay those to our panelists here uh, during Q&A time at the end of our conversation. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, share this video that we have put together as part of this project. Um, Bear with me just one moment. And Hi everyone, my name is Tara Barish. I'm the Curatorial and Collections Manager for the Moab Museum. We are a natural history museum and a cultural museum serving Moab and the greater Colorado Plateau region. 
As a part of our virtual programming, we are excited to be partnering with Utah Humanities in bringing the Humanities in the Wild program to Moab. Okay, my name is Bertram Zabatawa. I am a Hopi tribal member from the village of Old Araibi, a member of the Corn Clan. I'm Don Montoya, I'm a former archaeologist with the Bureau of Land Management and a former museum curator with the Anasazi State Park Museum in Boulder, Utah. We're here today looking at prehistoric Native American rock imagery sites near the Colorado River. We are at the boulder panel that is known as the birthing panel. From an archaeological perspective, what we have is imagery through time. The earliest indications that we have are what we call from the archaic period. The archaic imagery is evidenced by a lot of curvature, a lot of abstract elements, and then through time, the uh, rock imagery styles become more complex until we get to what we call the formative period. It's more geometric, and then after we get through the formative period, then we then see a proto-historic or imagery of the ancestral peoples that are here today. He was mentioning about the different styles and time periods. A lot of the visuals, knowing to be the birthing panel, you do have the females that's showing of birthing, not just of that prominent figure over there, but you can see the linear style of a female figure. Female figures say not necessarily just a female as a mother giving birth, but in our histories of the Hopi, we do have certain female deities that we know of this day, which the major important one would be Spider Grandmother, that also gave guidance and aid to the ancestors while they were traveling. But you even have female figures of the mother of all game, or even the natural resource of the natural rock salt. So you have the salt lady or salt woman as well. There's no name tag to show accurately which female it is, but you know we can just generally know it's a female figure. We're now at the mouth of Moonflower Canyon. Moonflower Canyon is unique in that it's a spring-fed creek that's the upper end of the river. We have cottonwood trees here that date probably 100 plus years. We have rock imagery sites near the confluence of perennial waters in the Colorado River. Here we have imagery of middle archaic peoples and that's evidenced by that image there that has the vertical striping and looks like antenna coming out of the head. That's very similar to the uh, imagery that we have that are called the pictographs. So that's the painted imagery of the Barrier Canyon style. And the different styles and time periods, again, some repatinations, some kind of looking fresh, or even again, looking that similar style with the pictographs. Maybe that just carried on from the regional land areas where, where they were at. As Don was sharing about a lot of the imageries being by the confluences into the main Colorado River, snake symbols or the wavy lines, just the commonality for the descriptions of the water. So the riverways, the channels, you know, water sustains life. So definitely wherever is water, you will find maybe the ancestral site, occupation locations, or where they were visiting and making maybe their pilgrimages or to conduct ceremony or just connect back to nature, or connect back to the Mother Earth. So there's always variations of understandings of how place sites were being utilized by the ancestors. We're now at a rock imagery site that's commonly referred to as the Wall Street or the Wall Street panels. This one that we're looking at is particularly unique in that we're transcending a time component. So for example, the one on the bottom, as we discussed, these are more abstract, more nonlinear. As you can see from the winding image that we talked about as being indicative of water or waterways, but if we pan up the panel and we look above that, there are several geometric figures spanning a period of anywhere from you know, 1,500 to 2,000 years between the time that these lower figures were put on versus the upper figures. And then myself, what I do see here in the uppers is descriptions of hunting 
of the multiple spoked antler one is definitely a depiction of the elk. But if we were going to talk about the techniques of the, how it was executed or pecked into the rock, definitely the lower ones show of just the pecking into and penetrating over that layer and into the inner sandstone. Whereas more of the upper level ones on the Pantina definitely show the circular. So maybe having that hand pump drill or just a common, you know, turning with the fingers. So there's also variations in the techniques of how they were created and executed. We're now at a popular rock imagery site called the Poison Spider site. It's directly across the Colorado River from the confluence of Cane Creek. So we're coming down to where we have uh, today's contemporary Native American descendants of these ancestral peoples, the tribes that have cultural affiliation to this area around Moab particularly the uh, Western Puebloan tribes and the uh, Ute and Paiute Numic peoples. This is actually my first time to be at this particular site of the poison spider. As a Hopi person coming from Northeastern Arizona to visit and see these sites here, it is just like a reconnecting of knowing where our Hopi ancestors, but not just of the Western Pueblo Hopi, the Zuni, Akuma, any Tiwa, Toa, Tewa speaking cultures that are found in New Mexico. You know, there's a lot of that connections that people would feel when they do come and visit these sites in different locations. Thank you for this opportunity to be part of this project here and uh, hopefully I can come again and visit other parts of the state of Utah. Kwa kwa, thank you. On behalf of the Moab Museum, we'd like to thank um, archaeologist Don Montoya for sharing an archaeological perspective of these ancestral sites and Bertram for sharing the spiritual Hopi perspective of these sites and I'd also like to remind everyone that if you find yourself visiting to visit with respect and by that don't make marks on the sites, don't make marks on the panels and please if you can refrain from touching the oils in your fingers can degrade and damage the site. So please enjoy the ancestral history with respect. Well, um, if anybody experienced some technical issues with the video being behind, we will have a link that we'll share and you can feel free to watch it again if there's a lot of great information in there and it's brief so feel free to check that out again um mary did you want to go over some zoom logistics before i start in on questions just uh, another note that video i will link in the comments it can also be found on the web uh event on our homepage and will be on the Facebook Live as well. Great, thanks, Mary. Um, so first, I would like to ask Willie, um, could you give us an overview of Utah Humanities and the Humanities in the Wild project? Yeah, so the Humanities in the Wild project is one that we're really excited about building and keeping going. Um, it was kind of brought to my attention by my predecessor, Michael McLean, and then also Megan Van Frank, who I believe is in the audience. Shout out, Megan. She's wonderful. Um, and essentially what the goal of Humanities in the Wild is, is to get participants and folks like audience members right here, right now, out into some of Utah's wonderful landscapes. Um, in non-COVID times, the idea is to take a scientist and to take a humanist um, and have them lead the trail. We got these little walkie talkies that can make it so if you're a slow walker or if you're a particularly quick one, you can still stay in tune to um, what the scholars are saying. But the idea is of going on this hike with two really smart people who are just able to break things down because um, having gone to a lot of these sites that we did in Moab, me by myself just visiting them, I, I would have just stared stupidly, right? I, I have no idea what a lot of these things mean. Um, and and that's one of the joys of the humanities in the wild program is that 
oftentimes when we enter some of these landscapes, there's so much science, there's so much history. And the idea is, yes, to give people um, a little bit more access to some of the stuff there that might not be at the surface. And since I got the floor right now, I also want to give a shout out to Kitty Erkenbreck, who is the one who created the video. She is phenomenal. It was so hot that day. And she's been able to do like hot Moab heat for hours and also like freezing spiral jetty um, weather for hours. So we're super stoked to have her on a project and supporting during these pandemic times. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, and also feel free to check out on YouTube. Willie can probably post a link as well of other videos from Humanities in the Wild. And they kind of speak to that whole project that they're working toward. And it's, it's pretty cool. I've watched a few of them and it's a really great concept. Um, is is Bertram, are you are you live right now? I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get onto it. I don't know. I'm getting some glitches. I can't get onto okay, the Okay, well, um we, we can hear you. Audio. We have so audio. that's great. I can just go ahead and ask um ask away <laughs> questions and, and you can respond as you'd like and Don as well. So Bertram, I'd like to direct this first question at you. What is rock imagery and why is it different from what non-natives call art? Well, what I view as being the rock symbols uh, is part of you know, the history, uh, maybe a parallel from some cultures, you know, they would refer to symbolism as you know, Sanskrit hieroglyphics. Uh, it's not basically per se art, even though there is progressions that occur from the archaic into basket maker and the modified basket maker, which does do realistic uh, human uh, body figure uh, features. Uh, but the rock symbols, you know, what I would understand, you know, as part of history, uh, when it was described in the video about the rivers and waterways, uh, it'll be so amazing to understand that, you know, ancestors, you know, would depict them as maps of the river corridors, of the creeks, the streams that are upon the land and you know it you know it could go down to more detail of you know just triangles or would be representing of mountains uh just cliff features will be just you know uh rectangular or you know 90 degree uh angles of linear symbols uh definitely depictions of ancestors or deities <clears throat> you know that help and give guidance to ancestors along the way on their migrations of travel. Uh, so again, you know, it's more of history, uh, messages from ancestors past to the present, uh, you know, us modern descendants as the Pueblo cultures of all the native peoples that are indigenous to these four corner state areas. And as well, you know, the later progressions into the modified basket maker Pueblo one to Pueblo three considered from like maybe 800s up until the 14, 1500s. We'll definitely have more of that artistic look to it because they were utilizing a lot of say the inspiration from geometrics from the pottery uh, within uh, the symbols, but they were also inadvertent, you know, again, as I referred to as maps or uh, views of the land. Uh, so it, it's not where talking about the pottery as well, but you know, that kind of carries on with the geometric symbolisms that carried from the pottery into the, uh, the rock symbols, you know, known as petroglyphs. And definitely, you know, rock art term, you know, again, um, you know, has different meanings and connotations to individuals uh, per se. Again, they look at it as, you know, creativity from the ancestor as an artist. But again, you know, maybe they were the ones that had these teachings to hand down or uh, actually, you know, we're very well skilled to utilize the different uh, uh, materials or tools that they had, you know, to carve into these sandstone cliffs, you know, that could be like basalt, lava, 
um, dolomite material, church boulders, river stones. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, you know, just, uh, I'm still trying to get the visual or, yeah, on the video of myself to, uh, to get to here. I don't know why it's not um, working. Oh, okay, there Here we go. Is. Finally, we got it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And so anyways, you know, that's, you know, just my views and understandings, you know, of the rock symbols uh, that we know as the petroglyphs and individuals know it as rock art. Uh, again, it will be the more creativity of the individual to give it more clarifying detail into uh, the symbolism. Great, thank you for that. Um, the next question kind of might overlap a little bit. Um, can you share with us some of the ways that these panels are important to native communities? You already kind of spoke to how they're historically relevant and they can provide information like being maps or messages, not just a creative expression. Is there anything else that you want to add to that? Uh, with my understandings as well, you know, that uh, different individuals from other Pueblo cultures or even from my tribe as the Hopi tribe from Northeastern Arizona have visited, you know, the uh, Moab area. And one thing I didn't touch upon, you know, was, you know, basically the symbols were left there as identities from the ancestors that they had clan identifications to themselves or the families that were migrating or traveling through the area. So it would be, you know, just uh, say like in our modern cities and towns, you have the, um, you know, the, what people would refer to as the graffiti or tagging of, you know, the box cars or site buildings. It is just particular to, to that similar parallel understanding, you know, it's just a statement giving you know, the symbols as, you know, I was here, we were here. And so modern descendants, you know, coming to visit to these sites where these clan symbols are found, um, it just gives them a broader understanding that, you know, yes, their ancestors have traveled or migrated and visited into there or resided in that area. So that would be, you know, just further expanding onto the understandings of the rock symbols of clan identity, clan identification, or just that understanding they were here at one time. Uh, but as well, you know, again, individuals as orators or historians to the clans or societies, uh, again, they would have that sharing of the teachings down to the younger generations, uh, you know, um, when they're gathering or do a, as a pilgrimage, even though, say, in archaeology, they re reference to, you know, that a lot of the ancestors left and abandoned the ancestral sites. But in ways of consultation and visiting the areas, it is still, say, this modern uh, type of pilgrimage to return back or reconnect back to the ancestral sites uh, where all of these are abound as, you know, inclusive with the rock symbols, the ancestral sites, um, even, say, granaries as well, you know, the uh, pantries or storage uh, places. So uh, it just all fits together of confirming, or even say, even with the pottery shards that you see scattered or abound in these ancestral sites. Again, this is all just evidence of the footprints of the ancestors. Again, just giving that statement, I was here, we were here, we traveled three. Wow, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, so much, so much to learn in all of that. Um, <laughs> okay. It's just cool. Um, Don? Um, I'll pivot to you. Um, what, what can archaeologists learn from rock imagery? First of all, uh, ar archaeology, we take a more scientific approach. And what we look at is the material culture. And we do an examination of the material culture and not necessarily uh, look at uh, ethnography or look at uh, the native interpretations, but take, again, a more scientific approach in looking at, at the material culture itself. 
And from that material culture, we, we look at, uh, you know, how humans survived in the past. Uh, we look at the different kinds of technologies that are available uh, to them. Uh, we look at the subsistence, uh, subsistence patterns and look to I, I identify these ancestral peoples, again, from a more uh, scientific approach. Uh, and what we try to do is uh, reconstruct their life ways by examining the material culture. And by doing that, you know, help us to understand the people, you know, the events that shape their lives. And, you know, could be argued in some ways as a passport or a look into the past. So again, the difference, uh, we take a more uh, scientific approach and look at uh, the material culture and examine just the material culture. Great. Um, so when non-native travelers look at rock imagery, they might interpret a panel from a basic perspective. For example, a plant like yucca or corn, a circle, perhaps the sun, a human or seemingly elusive wavy lines and spirals. However, we know that there is a much greater story being told in these images. What are some ways to interpret rock imagery that we might not think of at first glance? That, that's difficult from an archeological perspective. Uh, but personally, uh, I don't do interpretation. I leave that for the native peoples like Bertram. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have limited knowledge that they've, they've passed on to me. And what, what I look at is, uh, and some, some of the things, for example, I mentioned the, the life ways and uh, progression. Uh, we can do a relative dating of the rock imagery. Uh, when the initial image was placed on there, and then that will weather through time. And then by applying science, we can uh, look at um, electron microscope, uh, you know, hydration of the rocks, you know, and, and try to apply science to get an estimate as to, you know, how, how old the images are. And then we look at, uh, again, variations in style and we find uh, stylistic differences through time and try, try to you know, use applied science. So the interpretations that archeologists look at is uh, imagery through time. Uh, we look at a temporal displacement, you know, where, where the images appear. So for example, <laughs> along the Colorado corridor here in the Moab area, we may have a particular image that is repeated at different places. We see that imagery all along the uh, Colorado River corridor. So we, we then can interpret that it's uh, space trans, uh, transcendental. It, you know, it, it transcends different locations. Mm -hmm. So the same peoples may be appearing in different locations. Uh, the archaeology information can convey that to us. And we also look at, uh, you know, the, again, the transition through time. So the imagery, in many cases, uh, transcends both uh, time and space. Bertram, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, yeah, you know, we would want to go ahead and add on to that. Um, yeah, I would just uh, have an understanding that, you know, again, maybe with the human figures, it would maybe describe scene of ceremony, uh, maybe a hunting or gathering parties, uh, circles or sun symbols, you know, again, that, that, you know, that could be obvious of sun symbols, but maybe circles, concentric circles, spirals. Uh, what I have been understanding and viewing of different sites is that some of them are even interacting uh, with shadow or sun or sunlight or sun daggers or shadow daggers that would mark off of the four seasons. 
And so, you know, just within the past week, of, you know, this time of the fall equinox, you know, there is, you know, multiple areas, you know, at present day villages, ancestral sites, uh, you know, that these type of seasonal markers would be seen and viewed at. And obviously, you know, there in New Mexico, the, the famous one or commonly known is, you know, known as Chaco Canyon of having, you know, different uh, areas or the Fajada Butte that's located there as one of the uh, major uh, locations of viewing the sunlight and shadow that interacts with the spiral symbols there. And then uh, again, maybe wavy lines are again, that common thing for rivers or even though the snake clan would have serpent or snake symbolism. But again, that could be like another type of uh, code you know, to represent rivers, streams, and water channels that are found on the land. Um, again, as I shared of geometrics, you know, obviously triangles would be like the silhouettes of mountains or even uh, rectangles, you know, could pertain to specific types of buttes or the silhouettes of that. So uh, yes, it would be various. And even though there is, you know, different books, publications, guidebooks out there, you know, just to share of common understandings or, you know, the common interpretations of these symbols, you know, a lot of people would follow uh, through that. Uh, but myself as a guide here on the Hopi Reservation, you know, I do get into clarification, more detail of, you know, what I've been viewing of collaborating and doing my own documentation research uh, with these seasonal symbols that are found, not just on Hopi, but in other uh, ancestral sites as well. Uh, so it could just be, you know, that understanding of knowing or understanding what symbols would mean to, uh, to specific locations. Uh, even yeah. say geometric symbols, flower symbols, yeah, they could be of flowers, sunflowers. But to get more into detail and accuracy of clarifying information, you know, ancestors could find, you know, maybe the water dowsers can find the, you know, where water is located at or more um, understandings you know ancestors you know could feel of energy and so when we talk about templates or ley lines or the grid um, you know any kind of template you put in particular areas you know you can find these as the templates that maybe ancestors utilized in the past to establish these ancestral sites or what i term from archaeo astronomy you know, the templates are located in the sky as the constellations, stars and planets, you know, that they would align to these ancestral sites or even for our Hopi area. <clears throat> now the common understandings is, you know, the first, second and third Mesa, you know, did have a parallel alignment with uh, Orion's belt uh, back in December 21st, 1100 AD at 118 AM was the specific understandings of the alignments of these village areas uh, to that belt. And so that's where in archaeology, you know, what I would share on that is, you know, <clears throat> they wonder why, you know, from 800s to 11, 1200 time periods, these ancestors abandoned the major sites, but they relocated to their established centers or middle places as the modern present day locations of all the present uh, Pueblo cultured people. And so we are, again, just the modern descendants of our ancestors of the past that did establish and create and built these ancestral sites as, you know, wonders, uh, as national monuments that we know as Mesa Verde, Chaco, uh, Canyon de Shea, and so forth. Okay. Um... You, you, your answers are so great. They kind of run into my, my next questions. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so are you able to share with our listeners how some natives interact with these panels today and how they perceive and feel about them and whether you yourself visit panels? Uh, yeah, like I was mentioning about, you know, doing the viewing or documentation of, you know, the certain panels that I do understand are part of the markers of the four seasons. Uh, you know, we do still have in our Hopi culture, our, our villages, 
uh, some individuals that are designated sun watchers, but it's not just of sun watching, it's also for the lunar observations and even just knowing and understanding the movement of the sun and moon in the horizons of sunrise or sunset would also have that interaction of knowing what time of season it is. So, you know, spring equinox is definitely, you know, marking the beginning of the planting cycle, but as well preparing the fields, you know, to get ready. Uh, fall time around this time is, you know, the uh, main bulk of the harvest, you know, that's being brought in. Um, summer solstice, you know, would be sort of the cutoff point to deposit seeds uh, into the ground. Uh, to mature or grow, you know, up on this uh, end of fall, which would be, say, into next month of uh, October. We're also, even uh, my understandings now, understanding and learning about the midpoints between the equinoxes and solstices, um, again, would pertain to whatever ceremonies are conducted within those months of uh, May or October that are kind of the common understandings of the midpoints between the equinoxes and solstices. Uh, so yes, you know, there is still, again, going to view these at ancestral sites by certain individuals. Uh, I myself, again, you know, just wonder as amazement, you know, how they pinpointed all these markers to fall exactly on the dates that we see in our modern calendar as the equinoxes and solstices, or even, you know, midday or high noon markers, you know, really mark as that, you know, midpoint of the day as equinox is the understanding of day and night are equal you know, in time or even we have the equator dividing our earth as well so um, yeah it just falls down to amazement wonderment that these ancestors were really in tune you know to pinpoint even though they didn't have modern watches as you know to keep time or you know there were calendar keepers in other cultures say like with the mayan uh development of numbers and, and keeping of calendars you know it, it was just, you know, so amazing to understand what ancestors did back then that now we're realizing and understanding, you know, it was meant for, you know, us to continue this teaching to our younger ones. Um, so that's what I kind of, you know, pertain to of, you know, there is still pilgrimage and visiting and still having that feeling of amazement and wonderment, what our ancestors created and left for us you know, on the yeah. land. From my perspective, to, to answer that question, uh, in terms of how, how the Native people I interact with this, uh, what, what I'm able to observe is that um, they look to identify the, the cultural landscape. You know, what, what are the markers on the landscape uh, and, and what they perceive uh, one of the things I've noticed, and, and I've been blessed to uh, have uh, numerous uh, consultations with the, the tribes in my uh, job as a previous curator in uh, Boulder, Utah, and, uh, working with the uh, Bureau of Land Management for uh, going on eight years, and then now working as an independent cons cons consultant. Uh, I'm blessed to have people like Bertram you know, to take them out to you know, the sites that I know. And one of the observations that I've made is that uh, they generally leave an offering at the sites. Uh, that offering can be um, a splash of water from a water bottle. It could be a corn pollen, you know, that they have from a personal medicine pouch, a sage uh, offering. But generally, they'll, they'll leave an offering you know, at an archaeological site, particularly a rock image site. And what they've conveyed to me, and it seems to be consensus, regardless of um, which consultant I take, whether it's uh, one of the Pueblo and uh, guys like Bertram himself and uh, some others and uh, Paiute people as well, is their perspective is that the rock imagery, especially the anthropomorphic images, that these are living entities, that the, the image up there is, is a living entity. And it's been conveyed to me that they are there to teach the people 
And surprisingly, it's not a collective teaching, but the imagery is intended to teach individuals. So if we were to go to a rock image site, uh, the message that you, Tara, receive may be significantly different than the message that I receive. And that's one of the things that the uh, Native peoples, the, the guides that I've gone with will take the time to have me, you know, stop and contemplate, you know, what, you know, what, what am I being taught at, at this image site? So that, you know, that's what I've learned from, from the native people and you know, their understanding of the panels. And um, occasionally uh, I'll be privy to a uh, private interpretation, you know, from what Bertram is sharing with us, but uh, as an archaeologist, you know, it, it's not my place to, sh to share that information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip a question because I think Bertram talked a lot about how the landscapes impact um, the images on rock surfaces. Are you able to share with us, um, either of you, both of you, why full interpretations of all rock art um, might be inappropriate. Why um, can't we know everything about what what the meaning is on on the at the archaeological site, the rock art, um, rock imagery? Um, why is some of that confidential? Well, okay. What I would share is, you know that there is, you know, that esoteric information, you know, if you're not, <clears throat> you know, say like initiated into a particular society or, you know, basically born into, you know, a tribal nation, uh, you know, again, there is the line drawn where I do as a guide <clears throat> to share of common understandings of specific symbols, but, you know, again, it's just not me to share or say, you know, I'm a member of the corn clan. So I feel comfortable in sharing whatever I could feel that is, you know, appropriate to share with my clients. But, you know, I'm not a member of the sun clan, the eagle, the bear clan. You know, they each individually have their own migration histories. They know of which ancestor sites their ancestors, you know, traveled and resided at for a while. Uh, so, you know, yes. I would say it's just definitely going to be overload if you know everything or too much. It's it's mm -hmm. it's not a good thing for any for any person. And even though <clears throat> if uh, statements were made, that, you know, an individual is initiated into multiple societies, which kind of was that concept understanding of uh, individual being a uh, um, interpreter for that book of the Hopi by Frank Waters, um, you know not a Hopi individual can initiate in it to too many societies and, and learn a lot and state and claim, you know, he knows everything or she of, of Hopi, you know, that's a, a, you know, that's a misinformation. Uh, so again, you know, there is a line drawn as well, you know, in, within consultation with any archeologists, uh, museum institutions or other organizations that you know, if there's multiple tribal members in a consultation, um, they would be conversations in the language first to agree upon you know what information is allowable to share and what is not. So yeah, again, we won't just you know expose everything, which actually you know eventually happened all those hundreds of years ago and all the studies and publications of all the anthropologists, ethnographers, you know that came and visited all the different. <laughs> several cultures, but basically, you know, around the world, you know, they wanted to know how people, you know, connected to the land, how they went forward, what gods or deities they prayed to. So you have all these books about world culture histories, uh, but again, you know, it was not there to expose everything. So again, there is the limits of uh, information shared. That makes sense. Um, Don, did you have anything to add to that? Well, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I've been fortunate, as Bertram mentioned, uh, you know, if, if 
I go out with Bertram, he's uh, more than willing to share general information about the corn clan. And if his uh, clan symbol is present, you know, at the rock imagery site, then he's uh, open to sharing gen for general information uh, about the clan, the migration of the clans, but not necessarily any uh, sacred information that pertains to uh, ceremonies that might have been performed at that site. You know, that's uh, sacred or privileged information. Uh, the same thing, uh, for example, with uh, another Hopi informant that I've gone out with that's a member of the Bear Clan. He's been able to share some uh, bear migration uh, stories from his clan, but again, not disclose any of the uh, ceremonial or sacred elements of going to the site. That's been my personal experience, and uh, not, not only with the uh, Hopi tribe, but also uh, members from the uh, Ute tribe, both the uh, Ute Mountain Ute, Southern Ute, and the Uinta Uray uh, Reservation, has been fortunate to you know, have members of those tribes and specific clans you know, share information with me. Great. Um, it, it's really interesting to me that it's not just about confidentiality, but there's also that aspect that, that you both kind of touch on, that there's, there's many cultures affiliated with many different sites and not, not every native or tribal member is going to have all the information on every rock imagery panel. And so there's there's the, the confidentiality, but there's also that it might not be, it might not be for one person to, to interpret. Um, that's super interesting and I think important for our listeners to hear. Um, kind of wrapping up on, on these questions before we turn it over to some of our audience's questions. Um, what do you think the public has to gain from projects like this? Um, what are your hopes and what would you like for people in the audience, non-natives to really take away from this information and other than just respecting these sites, what would you like them to know? I guess one of the things that the what this program offers is uh, the ability to reach a wider audience. I think that's great because most of the, the consultations and the trips that I've been on the field have been, you know, limited to, you know, less than a dozen people, for example, uh, you know, 10, 12 people maximum. But a program like this, you know, allows us to, to reach a, uh, a wider audience. Um, It's great, you know, I, I, I like it. Bertram? I would probably go on along the same lines with uh, Dom about all of that as well. But yeah, just, uh, just giving a broader understanding that, you know, again, it's not rock art, you know, per se. It is, you know, what we shared, you know, within this program that, you know, yeah, definitely giving a more broader understanding, respect for these sites. And again, since I'm located here in Northeastern Arizona, and these are the sites that are found in your state of Utah, again, you know, that would give more people in your state, you know, that appreciation to know that, you know, these locations are there in your state of Utah, where I would pronounce in my language, <clears throat> the name of the Ute people, Utah, and that, you know, became the state name because, you know, the Utes uh, tribal people are the ones that live in that regional area. And that came by way when uh, the Mormons, you know, uh, visited my village of Old Arrive back in the mid 1800s uh, under the direction of that actual Brigham Young, Thales Haskell and Marion Shelton. And so, you know, even, you know, that pronunciation of the the tribal name for the Ute, you know, again, became that state name is what I understand. And so, you know, it's, again, just giving that broader understanding for the audience to know and appreciate, you know, these locations are there within your state and 
again, just the common understandings, you know, that of what we're sharing with this program or, you know, for this presentation, you know, they are definitely going to take away with some more clarifying understandings. Absolutely. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and add this last question. Um, I think it's really important. You've already touched on it a little bit, but I'll just ask it anyway. How can we as a community be effective stewards for these cultural sites? One common approach is by writing articles and increasing awareness, but this can also increase visitation and risk. How do we balance sharing these important spaces with our visitors while showing respect for the tribal communities who are relationally and spiritually linked to them? From, from my perspective, what I'd like to see is uh, people taking a more active approach, you know, rather than just uh, passively or recreationally, you know, visit the sites and, you know, so what, it's a once in a lifetime type thing, or it's, you know, something nice to see. So I, I'd like to see more active participation. Uh, there's advocacy groups that people can join. Uh, for example, here in Utah, we have the Utah Rock Art Research Association. And there are members of that association that, you know, it isn't just for Utah, you know, and they have members from Europe and other states. Uh, another one here in the state is the uh, Utah Statewide uh, Archaeological Society. Uh, so I would say, you know, become a member of an advocacy group uh, and uh, take Part in site stewardship, you know, whether it's vicariously, you know, through an organization or joining a, a, an advocacy or a stewardship group. Yeah, learning more makes you care more, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Bertram, did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, you know, just again, you know, that stewardship, you know, site managing could definitely, you know, be that helpful positive <clears throat> to monitor these sites. Uh, and again, you know, like you said, you know, it's a balancing act. You know, you expose or share of information of where a location is that is maybe not pinpointed within certain maps or book publications. And then, yeah, you might have more high visitation um, visits there. Um, again, you know, some people would be, say, disrespectful, and that's when you get that evidence of vandalisms, vandalisms defacements, uh, scratching or add-ons uh, onto these imageries. And, you know, once when that's done, it's very hard to try to, you know, recorrect or try to erase it because, you know, it, it, it is damaging that, you know, if you completely deface a, a rock symbol, that is basically the act of your erasing history as well. Because again, that orator or historian, not knowing what that symbol is, could not give information or teachings, you know, not viewing of that symbol. Um, so again, you know, it is part of that site monitoring, having that respect and, you know, just again, taking in the energy or enjoying, you know, what the ancestors created from the past. Um, that we see, you know, present day. Yeah, thank you, both of you. Um, I'd like to bring Willie back in for a moment um, before we go to <laughs> our community. Um, this, this project, part of the Humanities in the Wild project, has been made possible by the Utah Humanities Council. What other work does the Utah Humanities Council do that viewers might be interested in? And what excites you, Willie, about this project in, in relationship to the whole of Humanities in the World? So right now we're in the middle of our Utah Humanities Book Festival, which is hundreds of events just like these all across the state, in-person, hybrid. Um, and there's definitely one of those events that's meant for you because we have hundreds of these books out there. So it doesn't matter whether you're into like weird sci-fi stuff or like stuff that's specifically historical or poetry, or if you're looking for something for children, um, we definitely have um, an event meant for you. As far as how I'm excited about humanities in the wild. I think so much of 
Utah is known for its, you know, spectacular landscapes. But at the same time, we don't always know the history and the science behind all these, which is why voices like Don's and Bertram's are so important to us, helping get give us um, a starting point for how to enter um, more meaningful relationships with our environment. On the native angle, um, there's also kind of a push for programming um, that we're doing. Uh, if you go to the Glendale Library on October 11th in Salt Lake, or if you go to the Brigham City Library on October 20th, um, there's going to be Darren Perry, who's going to be talking about his book, The Bear River Massacre, about the massacre of the Shoshone, um, which is a huge part of our region's history that I many, many people don't know about, is that one of the largest, well, the largest massacre in the United States of Native folks happened really within our own, like, um, backyard um, here in Utah and Idaho region. Um, so there's a lot of history to familiarize folks with and to talk about, um, and that's part of what we're trying to draw attention to with a lot of our work in the humanities is telling those, you know, undertold stories or untold stories and making sure that we're able to have um, greater dialogue about them. Um, I'm not the only person at Utah Humanities. We have Megan doing amazing waterways tours and Think Water Utah across Utah. We have Caitlin McDonald doing um, community conversations. If, you know, this, if this convo wasn't enough for you and you wanted to be able to speak and talk about it, you know, we can set up a community conversation about the native rock imagery and you know some of the issues happening in Moab revolving all around that. Um, there's a lot of possibility there. And last but not least, we have um, Josh who does um, a lot of programming within schools, specifically um, um, doing outreach to historically marginalized communities, and he's been doing an amazing job there. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to play with us. Um, if you are either a community organization or an individual trying to um, start a conversation in your community using the humanities, and for us, like one of the most valuable things about the humanities, you know, is that you can throw statistics at things, you can um, kind of talk, debate about things in that like abstract way. But um, what we draw on is just human stories and connecting with one to one, one to one personally, um, so that we can gain a really like a deeper understanding of these issues. So that's what we do at Utah Humanities. And we're so happy that y'all were able to make time tonight um, and definitely be looking out for us. Um, follow us on Instagram at Utah Books Fest or on Twitter or on Facebook. And you'll be able to keep updated with all the um, wonderful things we got going on. Um, this definitely will not be the last time you see Bertram and Don um, supporting our events. So if you love them, make sure to follow. Brad. Thanks, Willie. Um, Mary, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to you and see if there's any questions from the audience that we have time to answer in just the next 10 minutes or so. Hi, yes, thank you. And thank you to numerous people who have written in with questions and comments. Some of them I'm going to try to roll together just so we can get to several. Um, a couple of folks have asked about how sites on private land might be best stewarded and thoughts about the ethics of that um, and how, how to deal with that situation. S statutorily, the private landowner or land that's not owned uh, or managed by a state or federal agency you know, that's a, a purview of the private uh, landowner as to whether they allow uh, in individuals to go to archaeology sites on their lands. So I would say, you know, definitely respect private land ownership and gain permission from uh, the, the, the property owners. Um, many sites, you know, are, are on private land. So I would say, you know, respect the landowner's rights. And then uh, there are, again, the advocacy groups, uh, the um, Utah Rock Art Research Association, you know, they're, uh, they've got a catalog of sites that are on uh, private and institutional lands. So I, I would say work, work with the landowner and work through uh, the advocacy groups uh, to record the sites and have site, site stewardship on that. Thank you, Don. Is there anything you wanted to add to that one, Bertram? Um, that's pretty much, you know, the, the common understandings to get that 
uh, allowance to visit on private lands. Because yeah, you know, basically, you know, you don't want no strangers to come onto your yard and not knowing of their intent. So, you know, it is again, best to contact the landowner uh, of, you know, that allowance if they allow to visit on their land, knowing that there is a site uh, within their property. Absolutely. If you were to find a hike advertised on a blog or on the internet um, and it's on a reservation, that's not okay. You can't just go walking um, without permission from someone on that reservation because that's, that's reservation land. So mm -hmm. it's important to make sure that you know what that land is. You don't know who posted onto that blog or said, you know, you can go mm -hmm. here well that might not be okay so make sure that you know whose land it is yeah Another? just to add on to uh, all going, uh, just to add on to that you know yes like uh uh we have our hopi cultural preservation office and department you know anything of a type of organization a uh, group or family that wants to host some type of gathering or even say again that example of you know a hike um, you know they want to know who is coming or to get the proper permits you know to to host that as well on reservation lands so you know yes you know that is a good point that you made out Tara about you know not knowing that maybe somebody posted that and invited people but if they went through the proper channels to hold and host you know that event on the reservation land. Thank you all for your perspectives on that one. Um, another question, we've gotten a couple variations of the same question. So again, I'm combining, uh, but folks are wondering if there's ever any attempts to try to see if perhaps the same individual created rock imagery at one site and then at another site. Someone wrote in saying, uh, there are pictographs at Sago Canyon and across Westwater Creek in the book clips that appear to be the same artist. Is this something that you do? Uh, within the uh, BLM, for example, we, uh, catalog where the, the rock imagery sites are and doing that. And there has been uh, research conducted to look at the spatial displacement or the, the, or the spatially where these images are and where they're consistently shown. So for example, the um, imagery at Sago Canyon and uh, Moab area were able to geo reference you know where the sites are and where similar images are that might lead to possible migration paths or the same individual or the same uh, clan or group you know that visited these sites and those are you know detailed research you know projects that are you know coordinated by uh, the land management agents, you know, anybody wanting to do research like that, you know, have to follow the proper channels and protocols about conducting that research. And it's certainly available, the, the agencies to, do facilitate that kind of work. Thank you. Yeah. Another uh, question was someone wrote in saying, we love Nine Mile Canyon. How do the sites you are talking about in this project compare or relate to those? From, from, from my perspective, you know, the, the field office and land management agencies, you know, look to Nine Mile Canyon as the, the highest density of, you know, rock image sites. You know, they they look at that, but uh, you know, I would contend that, uh, you know, Moab, for example, you know, the uh, Moab field office, you know, record, has recorded, uh, you know, uh, well over 12,000 sites. You know, there's well over 30,000 sites in San Juan County, for example. And, you know, this is just archaeological sites. Um, I, I know that we have uh, 
an inventory of well over 500 rock image sites. Um, and there was an attempt at one time to have the Moab area designated as a uh, national historic district, you know, for rock imagery. You know, there's well over 100 sites, you know, just in the Mo in close proximity with in, in Moab as well. So uh, I, I don't know that they compare necessarily in terms of uh, any detailed imagery or making comparisons, you know, that type of thing. But in, in just the sheer numbers, you know, there's as many, if not more, right here around Moab than there are, you know, at Nine Mile Canyon. Thank you. Another one from an audience member specifically for you, Bertram. Um, I apologize in advance for my pronunciation of this place name, but someone was wondering if you can talk about the clan symbols at Tutuveni. If I'm butchering that pronunciation, I apologize. Uh, yes, yeah, I can share that information. Uh, yeah, the location north west of the Munkapi villages, the westernmost uh, by Tuba city, uh, Tutuveni boulders uh, definitely are those clan symbols specifically from individuals from the men's societies that went on pilgrimage towards the Grand Canyon uh, area. Uh, on their stops, you know, they would collect water and certain natural elements of pigments, certain stones. Um, again, what they are instructed or directed to gather uh, to their pilgrimage to connect towards the Grand Canyon area. So it is just a common understandings of the pilgrimagers clan symbols that are left there. So this kind of might, might fall into the previous questions about if the same individual or ancestor, you know, created you know, the symbols in a, another uh, site area. Um, that would be, you know, if individuals went on multiple pilgrimages through their lifetime, you would see that same repetition of that exact type of uh, depiction of their clan symbol. Uh, so, you know, that's what I would share on that particular location of the Dubeni. But uh, what I would understand again, when I do look and examine the land and the horizon or the landscape location there, if you go to one of the highest points above those boulders, uh, you will see these markers or the cairns, the, the stack rocks, that again would show the direction of where the pilgrimagers would be taking their trek to towards the Grand Canyon. Uh, so that's the information I could share uh, with them uh, for that question. Thank you very much, Bertram. Mm -hmm. um, one last question that I will bring to you. Uh, there are a couple extras that I don't believe we'll have time to get into this evening, but which I would be happy to follow up on on behalf of the museum in the comments on Facebook. Um, a couple folks have been inquiring about pictographs, uh, specifically wondering about what different red and white pigments used um, are made out of. Uh, from an archaeological perspective, you know, we, we've done uh, mineral analysis, you know, on the pigments. Uh, they're mineral, most of the time they're mineral pigments uh, and they're um, oxides, minerals, for example, uh, the um, calcium carbonate, you know, a lot of the white is uh, derived from that. Uh, depending on what mineral composition, uh, looking at what, what the pigments are derived from. Uh, there's a lot of oxides, for example. Um, iron oxides are used for the reds, oranges, yellows. So just the amount of iron that's in the oxide. And uh, generally, there are um, min mineral pigments and oxides. Thank you. In the interest of time, um, I think it, we are drawing to the close of our evening. 
Unless there's uh, any any other words in edgewise that anyone would like to get, I'll move on to the folks that we have to thank for this evening's conversation. All right. Well then, without further ado, again, this work has been made possible by Utah Humanities. Uh, we first and foremost, on behalf of the museum, want to extend a big thank you to both Don and Bertram for bringing their expertise and sharing their wisdom through the creation of that video, through this conversation, and through the exhibit that is on display at the museum through October 17th. Thank you to you both. In terms of Utah Humanities, uh, this project is part of their 24th annual Utah Humanities Book Festival. Annual free festival is the humanities gift to the community, allowing us to explore all sorts of ideas by interacting with great writers. The complete program is available at utahhumanities.org. Their thanks to the Book Festival's major sponsors, George S. and Dolores Eccles Foundation, Salt Lake City Arts Council, Salt Lake County Zoo, Arts and Parks Fund, Summit County RAP, Weber County RAMP, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, the King's English Bookshop, Weller Book Works, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Endowment for the Arts and Catalyst. From all of us at the Moab Museum, our members empower our programming. So thank you to our family of members, and we are grateful for all of you for tuning in and engaging with this conversation. As a reminder, this conversation has also been streamed on Facebook Live, and a recording of it will live there if anyone would like to revisit any part of it. The YouTube link of that video that we screened at the beginning will be available via our website, moabmuseum.org. And thanks once again to all of you panelists, Don, Bertram, Willie, and Tara, for this excellent conversation. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Yeah, quite, quite. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this. <laughs>